So today I'm going to tell you some stories. Uh, some of these you're already familiar with, and many of these you've probably never heard before, so I gave you a handout today uh, with my translations of some of these stories from early China. Now it would seem very straightforward, the idea of telling a story with pictures. It would seem almost childish. But it's actually more complex than that. And there are many different ways that you can do it. And the phenomenon itself does not appear till fairly recently in the art history of both the West and the East. And it appears at its particular time, uh, definitely after literacy. And it appears in a certain developmental sequence, which we'll see. But that same developmental sequence is not the same in China and in India and in the Greco-Roman West. The same different forms are present, but the timing is a little bit different. So I can talk a little bit about the kind of factors that lead to that. A lot of it has to do with the underlying uh, religious ideology, the underlying political ideologies, and not just the technical repertoire of the artists and, and how they know they can tell a story with pictures in a certain sort of way. So today, um, I'd first like to problematize a few things. Um, first of all, what is a narrative? Well, a narrative usually involves three things. You have a protagonist. Let me put this down. You have a protagonist of the story, and you have movement through both space and time. Now, the narrative itself will consist of the story that you're telling, and then the medium or the form to which you're telling it. You're telling it orally, you're telling it through a written text, you're telling it through pictures, or a combination of all three. Now, scholars have pointed out that for a narrative or a picture to truly be an, an illustration of a narrative, something has to happen to the protagonist. <coughs> they have to be transformed in some way. They have to be either psychologically transformed, physically transformed, transported in space. <laughs> So something has to happen to the protagonist to move them through space or time or some psychological or physical state. Now, one of the main things I want to explore today is technically how do you do this? How does an artist refer to or tell a story with pictures? And what does the audience assume to know? What does the storyteller know? And in what ways can you clue the person to the story itself. These aren't motion pictures. You can't show the whole thing. You can only show some of it in certain ways. And so we'll look at some of the different ways that you can do this and how they're limiting. Then what I mentioned earlier, what is the evolutionary development between these different forms of narrative illustration? And you'll be very familiar with them uh, in the next 20 or 30 minutes where I go through them for both the Greco-Roman West, for India, and for China. Another issue, where did the pictures come from? What is the relationship between the pictorial image and text that we have today of the same stories? Uh, for instance, the text of the Iliad and the Odyssey, or the Buddhist sutras, or the Chinese classics. What's the relationship between those texts and oral traditions or oral storytelling and then the tradition of the artisans themselves, of where they make pictures, how they transmit their pictures to their disciples who then produce pictures. The next one, what purpose do they serve? Why did you have to illustrate this story? You could always tell a story to someone. You could always write it down that the person can read. Why do you need to make a picture of it? Where is this picture placed? Who's going to look at it? And so why do you need to even illustrate it in the first place? And sometimes the choice of which method to use to illustrate the story is related to the purpose of the illustrations. Now in the Chinese case, one thing we need to look at toward the end of today's talk is the influence of Buddhism. Buddhism comes into China around the 2nd century AD, and it changes things. So it appears that there might be some influence of Buddhist pictorial narrative, and I'll show you some examples of early depictions of lives of the Buddha. And we'll look at what influence they might have had on Chinese narrative illustration. 
And in that vein, I'll also bring up the Malangle banner, which is uh, in the display upstairs, uh, so we can talk about uh, some possibly pre-Buddhist forms of this kind of narrative in China. So these are some of the questions I want to look at over the next hour, hour and a half. <clears throat> so let's start in the Greco-Roman West. And we'll start with these four different methods of narrative illustration. So we'll start with what some art historians have called simultaneous narrative illustration. So this is uh, a drawing off of a Greek cup, a Spartan cup from the 6th century BC, depicting the very famous story from Odyssey of Odysseus and the Cyclops Polyphemus. Now, for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with the story, um, Odysseus and his men um, are blocked into a cave captured by the Cyclops here, Polyphemus, and who immediately eats some of Odysseus' men. And they figure he's going to eat a couple every day until they're all gone. <clears throat> so what they do is they get him drunk. So here he's got a couple of the legs of the guys he ate earlier. <laughs> and so, you know, the Greeks don't drink pure wine. They water it down. So, but they give him unwatered wine to drink. And they get him really, really drunk. And then they take a huge trunk of an olive tree, which they've hardened in a fire. And when he's drunk, they jab it through his eye. So he's blinded. And then they manage to get out of the cave by hanging under the bellies of woolly sheep. And he's feeling the tops of the sheep to see who's getting out of the cave. And all they're all hanging underneath the sheep. And so they all escape from the cave alive, except for the few guys that got eaten earlier. <laughs> now, the earliest kind of Greek depiction of this story chooses to depict multiple moments at the same time. It's simultaneous. We only have one Polyphemus. But they're depicting several different points of the story at the same time in one image. So the legs here refer to the eating of the earlier sailors that weren't so lucky. The wine shows them getting him drunk. And then here's the big stick they're poking into his eye. The only thing they didn't depict was the escape under the bellies of the sheep. So this is quite an interesting way to do it, because it's kind of confusing when you see it's all conflated together. You have all the different elements of the story. But this is the earliest form we have of narrative illustration of known stories, is to produce all the events simultaneously in one visual field. So that's simultaneous narration. Okay. Now, within about a century of that, um, and the most common form, now the simultaneous form sort of dies out once these newer forms come about. And that's not the case in places like India and China. But uh, in, in Greece, that simultaneous form sort of drops out. And the most common form is monocene. And that's pretty self-explanatory. So a monocene is the definitive scene of a story that epitomizes the whole thing. If you could pick just one scene from the whole story that you could then remind the viewer of the whole thing, then you pick that one, and that's your mono scene. So everyone who knows this image would know exactly what story they're talking about. It's the most characteristic scene from the story. So it's a single event, not the first one, not the last one, not necessarily the climax, but usually. So they remind people of the whole story. Now, this story, uh, also from the Odyssey, uh, many of uh, these Greek things are going to be from the, the Odyssey uh, or the Iliad. This one, also from the Odyssey, is Odysseus killing the suitors. So Odysseus leaves home for the Trojan War, and then he's adrift at sea for a long time. Uh, his wife is besieged by a whole bunch of suitors, uh, these naked guys here. And she doesn't want to marry them. She puts them off for a very long time. Odysseus finally comes home in disguise. She sets up an archery contest where you have to shoot an arrow through, I think it's 12 axe heads, the little holes in 12 axe heads, with her husband's bow. No one can pull the bow. Only he can pull the bow. He comes in disguise, blasts it through all the axe heads, and then turns around and shoots down all the suitors with the help of Athena and his son. So this is the definitive scene. This is him turning his bow on the suitors who are totally taken off guard and killing them all. 
So this is monocenic. They pick just one scene from that episode of the Odyssey to show the whole thing. Now, starting in the early 5th century and throughout the uh, rest of the Greek period, into the Hellenistic period, is the idea of the segmented narrative. So what we have here are multiple scenes of the story. And the protagonist, this is important, the protagonist, the person involved, is repeated. Their image is shown more than <laughs> once. Remember, when we had the simultaneous, the Cyclops is only shown once, or the is only shown once. In the monocenic, obviously, everyone's only shown once. But in segmented, you get the same person more than once. And so this one is the contest of Theseus. And you'll notice that here's one scene here. And the guy, has, let me go through the stories here. The, the one on the left is Procrustes here. This is a guy who is a bandit. He lies in wait, and he has a bed. And he takes these unwary travelers, and he fits them into the bed. If they're too long, he chops off their feet. If they're too short, he stretches them and rips them apart. And so this is not a guy you want to run into, but Theseus has an axe here, and he gives him uh, the same thing, the same treatment. He chops up Procrustes and makes him fit into his own bed. So that's one of the, the labors of Theseus. Uh, here he's got to wrestle with this particular figure. Um, the guy he's wrestling with is uh, Cercyon, and he challenges all passers-by to a wrestling match, and who, if you lose, he kills you, and Theseus beats him and, and kills him instead. This, of course, is a Minotaur uh, on the island of Crete. But usually these scenes are divided by something. They're segmented. Here's a little mountain outcrop here. Uh, there's a tree between the scenes here. This is um, uh, the marathon bull that he subdues, and this is a particular big, dangerous boar, a wild boar that Theseus subdues. So Theseus appears in all of these, and it's usually divided by some sort of either architectural or uh, natural feature, so you don't get confused by seeing Theseus too many times on this. So this is a segmented narrative. Multiple scenes divided by some kind of dividing divider. Okay. Now, what many people would consider the most advanced, the most technically advanced form of narrative illustration is called continuous narrative illustration. And this does not develop until um, the late Hellenistic period and early uh, Roman imperial period. Now, the key points of a continuous narration, the protagonist is repeated, just like in segmented narrative. Multiple scenes are presented, but instead, the whole thing is in one visual field. It's not broken up by columns or dividers. All the scenes are present in the same landscape or in the same building. They're all present together in one unified space. And so here we have another story from the Odyssey. This is Odysseus and Circe. Uh, she's the person who, uh, when she feeds a special meal to Odysseus's sailors, they all turn into animals. And he uh, comes to try to rescue them, and the god Hermes tells him that this is going to happen, gives him a special herb to make him immune to it. So here is Odysseus being warned by Hermes. Odysseus goes into Circe's castle, and he then threatens her uh, at sword point to let his men go. And then up here, she brings them out, and she will take her bewitchment off of them and turn them back into men. But all this is presented within one courtyard, within one compound. So it's in a unified pictorial space. So that's continuous narration. Okay, so now we're going to go from the Greco-Roman examples to India. Now, in India, narrative illustration comes late, many centuries later than the Greco-Roman examples I just showed you. And so it's probably not a coincidence that when you first see depictions of real stories, like the lives of the Buddha, which is the examples I'm going to show you, um, all those forms are present from the beginning. You have simultaneous, you have monocenic, segmented, and continuous, 
all present, sometimes on the same monument, sometimes on the same wall. So it doesn't have the same logical developmental sequence that we saw in Greece and Rome. It's probably related more to the space. What kind of space does the artist need to use? Do they have a big, long archway that they can tell a continuous narrative on? Do they have just a single medallion on a column post? Uh, or do they have some other sort of confined space? So they might have chosen the different methods depending on what kind of space they need to fill. Now, the other factor in their decision probably has something to do with the ritual use of these carvings. All of the ones I'm going to show you are carved <coughs> onto either the railings or the outside archways of stupas. These Indian reliquaries, these big mounds that have remains of the, of the historical Buddha, and you circumambulate these. You walk around them with monks who are telling you the stories, and you move around in a certain fashion, so they need to tell you the stories. This probably is familiar to Catholics who do the Stations of the Cross. You go to each one, and you are told the story uh, from that perspective, and then you go on to the next story. Now, Buddhist texts are originally oral. From the life of the Buddha around the 6th century BC up until about the 1st century BC, Buddhism is an oral religion. There are no canonical texts. There are no sutras yet. So it's passed down exclusively orally. And the lives of the Buddha are recounted uh, orally. But by the 1st century BC, we start to get carved stone depictions of it. There might have been painted ones that are a little bit earlier. So these are related to an oral tradition, not necessarily a textual, canonical tradition. So let's go through some of these. Uh, we have monocenic. This is the conception of the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama. This is his mother, Maya, and she's lying on the bed. And this is the scene in which she conceives the Buddha. She has a dream that an elephant entered her womb, and then she became pregnant. And so this is the scene of the elephant floating over her in a dream as she is about to conceive the historical Buddha. So this is the most definitive, recognizable scene. Anyone who sees this would know, oh, this has to be the Buddha's mother and the dream of the elephant. And this is from the first century BC from the big stupa at Barhut in India. Okay, we also have in India simultaneous. This is on exactly the same monument, on a post very near to the other one. And here we have a depiction of a Jataka. A Jataka is one of the biographies of the life of the Buddha before he was the Buddha. The Buddha had hundreds of earlier lives in which he learned things, he gained merit. Uh, sometimes he was an animal, sometimes he was a human. And he was reborn again and again until he became the historical Buddha, at which point he realized he could end this. He could end the cycle of birth and death and reach the state of non-death non and non-birth, which is nirvana. But in one of these earlier lives, the Buddha was a deer, uh, this particular deer here. And this is the deer jataka, the deer tale of the Buddha's earlier life. Now, in this tale, uh, the deer notices a man drowning in the river. Here's the man drowning in the river. And the deer rescues him. So the deer rescues him uh, from the river. And the man is very, very thankful. And the deer says, well, just don't tell anyone that I can talk and that you know I'm this magical deer. And the guy says, yeah, I, I won't tell anybody. But then he learns that the king, the king of this particular kingdom, who's over here and here, um, the king tells about this deer. The king says, I need to have this deer. So he sends hunters out to go kill this deer. So the man breaks his promise, and here is the hunter uh, shooting at the deer. The deer then comes forward and says, excuse me, um, I saved this man, and he betrayed me. And the people say, well, this is a holy deer, obviously. This deer talks. This deer saves the man. So maybe we should kill the guy instead of kill the deer. <laughs> and the deer says, no, 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 I'll save his life, spare his life, but he doesn't deserve to die. And then the king and all of his men pray to the deer, realizing that he's a holy figure. 
Now we have here not a perfect simultaneous depiction. There's a little bit of messiness in this one. But we have multiple events depicted. The deer does show up twice. He shows up rescuing the man because it was really too hard to show him being shot at, worshipped, and rescuing the man at the same time. Because he's got to be in the river at some point. So the deer is in the river. But all the other depictions of the deer rely on this one deer. This deer is being shot at. This deer is talking. This deer is being worshipped by the king's men. So this is a simultaneous depiction. You'll also notice there is a caption up here. Now this is a very early caption. This would have been for the monks, the storytelling monks, as they go around, and this would have reminded them which Jataka this is. Although, once you see the deer and the man in the river, it's an obvious clue to the story. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip... I'm going to skip segmented for India, even though the segmented is quite evident, and go to continuous. This is the great departure of the Buddha from the East Gateway at the stupa at Sanchi, which is another great um, stupa from this time period, about 50 years later than the one I just showed you. This is an enormous, complex carved scene. Now, the problem with... Buddhist depictions, lives of the Buddha, you can depict the earlier physical form of the Buddha, but at this time in India, before the influence of Hellenistic Gandharan art from Pakistan, the Northwest, um, you don't depict the Buddha. It's like Islamic art. You don't depict Muhammad. So you don't depict the Buddha. You cannot physically depict him. It's an iconic. But you have to tell the story of the Buddha's life without showing the Buddha. So how do you do that? Well, you do that by certain visual clues. Um, and the clue here to look for is the horse and the parasol. The Buddha is a prince. He's a prince of a small kingdom. And so there's always an attendant holding a parasol over him. But the horse has no rider. The horse has no rider. The horse has no rider. No rider. That's the Buddha. He's on that horse. You just can't see him. So this is the famous scene in which he leaves his kingdom. He decides to give up being a prince uh, because he learns that all life is suffering. He's seen a dead man. He saw someone sick. He saw someone poor. He realized that he'd lived a sheltered life. He's going to escape this. He's going to leave the palace. So this is a simultaneous, excuse me, a continuous depiction of his departure from his palace. So here are the palace gates. Here is the first depiction here with Parasol leaving. Then we have another depiction here the parasol, and then another depiction here, moving out, and then over here, and then the final depiction are two footprints. And that means the Buddha has got off of his horse, and he then walks away and becomes a begging monk. So you can't depict him, but you can show his footprints. So you get the parasol, sometimes you get an empty throne, or you get just footprints. So the Buddha is depicted multiple times here by these visual clues. Okay, now let's go to China. Okay. So, I gave you a series of stories, and this is not, particular, not, not one of the ones I gave you, but I'm going to tell you these particular stories so we can go through the different types. So, narrative illustration in China also gets a late start. And that's because representational images in China get a late start. If you go back to Bronze Age art in China, going back to 2000 BC or so, it is not their tradition to depict humans or nature. You, unlike Egypt, unlike Mesopotamia, there are no images of the king. In fact, there are no images of Chinese kings for thousands of years. There are no great carved statues of the kings. There's no cult of the king's personality, no god cult. They depict patterns, decorative patterns, and masks, animal masks. But it's not representational. It's not meant to be mimetic or exactly mimicking nature. And this pattern goes on for nearly 2,000 years, where it's not encouraged or required by either religious or political needs to depict the thing as it is. So obviously there's no narrative illustration for a very, very long time. When we first see it is really in the Han Dynasty. So 200 BC, 
really is the first time we start to see narrative illustration. And the kind of stories that are chosen are all didactic. They are not for pleasure. They are not to entertain. They are to teach people moral values that the state wishes them to know. Ideas of loyalty, of filial piety, of frugality, all these sort of <coughs> patterns are to be inculcated by the state. And they teach these through certain narrative illustrations that you find on funerary monuments. So when the mourners come to the graveyard for the funeral or to give sacrifices later on, they'll see these images, they know these stories, and these stories remind them of how they are to behave as descendants of this person. So these are mono scenes. Um, the one down here is a very famous story from Chinese history called Two Peaches Killing Three Warriors. And here's a little stand on which there are two peaches. So the way the story goes, this guy is a prime minister, and his ruler, his lord, is worried that these three generals are getting a little bit too powerful. And he distrusts them, and he wants to get rid of them. But he's not strong enough to defeat them militarily. So he asks his prime minister, can you find a way to get rid of these guys? He said, I know the perfect way. So he puts a stand with two peaches on it and said, these two peaches are trophies for the greatest warriors among you. Now there's three of them. So immediately they start to fight over the peaches. <laughs> I'm the greatest. This guy says, I'm the greatest. He grabs it first. Then he feels so ashamed he cuts his own throat. This guy feels so ashamed at this guy cutting his own throat, he cuts his own throat. And this guy, because he wasn't even part of it, kills himself. <laughs> and so he manages to kill all three soldiers without ever raising the blade. So this is the pivotal moment when the first guy grabs the beach. The story up here is the story of Jija. Uh, Jija, uh, this guy here, was a famous minister. He went to visit the Lord of Shu. And the Lord of Shu really liked his sword. He had a really cool sword. And the Lord of Shu just he couldn't ask for it because it was impolite at the time. And Jija knew that he wanted a sword, but he was on a diplomatic mission. Couldn't give him the sword as a gift on this particular mission. So he came back a week later on another trip. Turned out the Lord of Shu had died already. And so he went to his grave mound, and here's the grave mound of the Lord of Shu, and he puts his sword on his grave mound so he can give him the sword as a gift. So these are mono scenes from that. Now here is a story that some of you might know, and this is the attempted assassination of the first emperor of Qin by the assassin Jing Ke. And this is told in a simultaneous depiction. So we have mono scene, now we have simultaneous. Now this story goes that the first emperor of Qin, who you see here, identified by this jade disc he holds in his hand, the first emperor of Qin was taking over all of China. He was conquering all the warring states and rolling it up like a carpet mat, uh, as the historical texts say. And these little states were frightened. And the one state called the state of Yan, Y-A-N, they were frightened that they were next. So they hired an assassin, this guy, Jin Ke, to go kill the first emperor, the, first, the king of Qin. And they gave him two things to get him close to the king. They gave him the severed head of a rebellious general that the Qin had put a warrant out for in a box. They also gave him a map of the richest territory of Yen with a sword rolled up in the map so that the head would get him close to the emperor. Then he would unroll the map to show him his new territory that they were going to give and pull the knife out and then stab him. That was the purpose. Unfortunately, um, he pulled the knife out grabbed the first emperor's sleeve and pulled, and the sleeve ripped off. And this is the sleeve floating in the middle of the air, which had ripped off, and there's the missing sleeve. And so in desperation, he then threw the sword, which then stuck in the wooden pillar of the palace. And at that point, the guards came in and hacked him to death. And so that was the end of the assassin. So what we have here is a simultaneous depiction of the whole thing. We have the first emperor, we have the ripped off sleeve, we have the head in the box, we have the sword here stuck in the pillar, and then we have this guy. This unfortunate guy was his second, his assistant. 
And his assistant immediately started quaking with fear as soon as they stepped into the room, which set everyone uh, at alarm. They said, why is this guy shaking so much? Why, why is he so nervous? And they made the excuse, well, he's a country bumpkin. He's never seen the Son of Heaven before. That's why. But he was paralyzed with fear the whole time and never helped out Jing Fu in the assassination of Temple. Here's he lying on the ground doing nothing. <coughs> and so you could tell this whole story with just this one simultaneous depiction. Uh, here we have that same scene, a little warrior, excuse me, this rubbing is not as good. And here we have the same elements in it with the addition of captions. The Chinese carvers will often make a cartouche, a blank spot, for captions. But the captions are not always filled in. And the reason, I believe, is because the artisans are illiterate. The people who are doing the carvings are not literate. Only the master draftsman uh, is literate, and he can come in later and put in the carvings or the captions. But the people that actually do the carvings are using pattern books, which I'll talk about uh, this Sunday in my other talk. And they only leave an open space, which is why most of these open spaces are never filled in when you look at Chinese carvings. Only if a literate person later comes in, he writes in Qin Wang, King of Qin, and here he'll write his assistant, Qin Wuyang, and here's uh, the head of Fan Yu Qi down here in the box. Okay. So we had monoscenic, we had simultaneous. Now in China, we eventually get segmented and continuous, but not till much, much later. Really simultaneous and mono scenes for hundreds of years. And then by around the 5th century, 6th century AD, you start to see segmented narratives. And I'll go through the Shun cycle in a little bit. That's one of the stories I gave you. But here you see a scene, another scene, and we have these dividing lines here. And then another scene from the story. And so these two aren't necessarily broken up, but these two are, and the ones down here are broken up by segments. So the first segmented narratives we get around the 5th century. The same thing for continuous. Continuous we don't get till the 4th, 5th century AD. This is the famous um, Goddess of the Luo River scroll attributed to Gukai Jir from the 4th century. It's actually a later copy. And it's so long I had to show it in multiple roles. It's like 30, 40 feet long. But here we have a famous scene of a scholar who uh, meets a particular nymph who lives at this river, and he falls in love with her, and um, they decide they can't be together because of, of circumstances. But she is depicted multiple times. The poet himself is depicted multiple times. But it's all within one gorgeous Chinese landscape. There is no break in this, no hard lines. You can view the whole thing as a landscape scroll and see the story as you unfold one arm thread at a time. But this doesn't show up until the 4th, 5th century AD. And one of the questions I'll ask later is, is that because Buddhism comes to China in the intervening centuries? Okay, so the main subject that I want to talk about are filial piety stories. And these are the copies I gave you on the handout. Stories of filial sons, specifically. The xiao zi zhuan. So the word for filiality in China is xiao. Filiality is supreme obedience to your father. Father and mother, but specifically the father. Sacrificing yourself and your own interests for the hierarchy, for your father. Now, why is this important to the government? Well, it's obvious. The government is a hierarchy. The government proclaims that it is like the father and mother of the people. Therefore, you are to support and be loyal to your father and mother and obedient, just like they have to be obedient to the state. And so the state promotes this cult of filiality to teach the people obedience to the hierarchy. <clears throat> now, this is written directly into the law code. Um, if a father beats his son to death, it's a minor financial penalty. If a son even talks back to his father, the son is executed. So there's 
a hierarchical division in this that's reinforced by the state in the law code and through these stories. The stories were compiled by a man named Liu Xiang, who was the official bibliographer of the empire. He compiled a series of books. One was called the Yan Zhuang, which are biographies of exemplary women. It shows how women were to be loyal to their husbands, not to their birth families, to their husbands' parents, to the state, and how these women sacrificed themselves, often killing themselves, to protect their chastity, their loyalty to their husband. And so he compiled a series of, of dozens of these from histories, from popular legend, from uh, local culture, and put them into a book called the Lien Zhuang. And I'm not going to show you pictures of those today, though they are illustrated as well. He then compiled another book called The Biographies of Filial Sons, in which he <coughs> compiled dozens of biographies of famous sons who were loyal, incredibly loyal, to their fathers, and very subservient to their fathers. And I'm, I'm going to show you examples of many of these, and I gave you translations. The original work of this second one is lost. We have the first one almost in its entirety. The second one is lost, but we have quotations from it. And those are the things I translated. Quotations from later versions, from other works, encyclopedias, things like that. From the very first, the work was illustrated. It was illustrated on panels, painted panels, which were put in the prince's palaces and put for the use of the emperor and his court so that people could be uh, inculcated with this kind of ideology all day long. They would see it around them, on the walls, literally. So these are paragons, and they go all the way back to uh, the mists of time, all the way to contemporaries who were said to live uh, in Liu Shang's own day. And they're not all entirely rational. There's often uh, mythical, magical elements. Gods and goddesses uh, often show up in these stories. But it's clear that when we look at the illustrations, that the illustrations are not specifically illustrations of this book. The stories existed already. He fixed a certain version of that story, but the artists were not necessarily reading his book. They already had an idea of these stories. These stories were out there. And so sometimes the pictures don't exactly match the text that we have. It's because the artist is making pictures from pictures. They're depicting it the way their master did, the way their master did. And it doesn't necessarily match any known text because the pictorial tradition appears to be a separate line of transmission from the textual transmission of these stories. Okay, so let's start to go through some of these. We'll start with the story of Ding Lan. Now, if you had time to read the handout, you read about Ding Lan. Ding Lan, unfortunately, his parents died too young. And he had served them very filially during his lifetime. And this is Ding Lan here, his caption right here. And so when his parents died, and in some versions of the story it's his mother, some it's his father, sometimes it's both parents, he carves a wooden statue of either his mother or his father or both, and he worships it and feeds it like he was still alive. He so misses serving his parents, he makes wooden parents to serve. And this shows his wooden parent right here. Now, one thing that the artist had to deal with is how do you depict a non-living human? How do you pick a statue as opposed to a person? Well, if you look at Ding Lan, he's in three-quarter pose. He's moving. He's active. If you look at the statue of his father, it's solid. It's um, immobile. And so that's how they're depicting its statueness. And that's something that I'll show you some other artists deal with uh, in later depictions of the story as well. So this is not a lie. Now, in the story, of course, there's an entertaining aspect where the neighbor comes by, he wants to borrow something, they ask the statue, right, the person to borrow the statue says no, and so uh, the neighbor comes by later, takes the thing, um, insults the statue, hacks at the statue, Ding Lan is really upset, kills the neighbor, um, the authorities come to try to arrest Ding Lan, and the statue cries real tears, at which point the authorities say, oh, this is a great sign. And so, no, you're not going to be arrested for, for this crime. Okay, so here we have, from the same time period, that one was painted on lacquer. 
This one is carved in stone. And so we have a, a different problem here. The stone carving is obviously starting with a line drawing, but then you carve it into bas relief. Here, they carve a cartouche with nearly the whole story in it. This talks about his parents died when he was young. He makes the statues so that he can serve them. And here we have Ding Lan. Here we even have the neighbor trying to borrow something up here. And once again, depicting the statueness of the figure of his uh, father here, um, sort of billowing. It sort of looks like it's sitting on clouds, but that's sort of a, an attempt by the stone carver to produce these kind of colored draperies. It's kind of hard with the limited technique they have at the time in stone carving to produce that kind of billows of drapery. So it sort of looks like a, a lump, a cloud lump with a head on top here. Okay, this one is from the third century AD. This is a line drawing from another stone carving. And here we have, once again, the caption of Ding Lan. And this is Mu uh, Ren Mei Xiang. This is the wooden person made as a statue. Now here they went too far. <laughs> it's, a, it's a piece of wood. Right? So they didn't need to think it as a human at all. I said, well, what, we'll just show it as a tree. And then we'll know that it's a piece of wood. Um, well, it's not human enough. So this, this one is not quite as successful. So here we have the food offerings here. And Ding Lan is, is kneeling before them. But this takes it a little too far in showing its non-human nature. Now this one, we're going up to the 6th century AD. This is a stone carving from a, a coffin, stone sarcophagus. And I'm going to show you several of these from stone sarcophagi. Now the sarcophagi would have been laid out in state for a while so that you could circumambulate the coffin of your father or your uncle or grandfather, whoever this was. And so you could go around the coffin looking at each of these stories. And so that's why these are carved on the coffins before the coffins are put in the ground. So here we have, once again, Ding Lan. And Ding Lan is before the statue. This time it's his mother. Sometimes, like I said, sometimes the mother, sometimes the father. And here is his mother. But here, after the arrival of Buddhism, they have a little bit of extra clues they can use. The statue is actually making two Buddhist mudras, hand signals. See the hand signal here? Do not fear teaching the different symbols of the Buddha. And so what better way to show that it's a statue, not a person, than by making a reference to Buddhist statuary. So it's acting like a Buddhist statue. It's totally anachronistic. This takes place long before Buddhism. But the people at this time were very familiar with Buddhism. So that's how they show its non-personness with these Buddhist hand signals here. Okay. So that's the story of Ding Lan. Then we have the story of Dong Yong, which I also translate for you. This carving is a bit damaged, and I'll show you some clearer versions in a little bit, but we want to go chronological. So in the story of Dong Yong, Dong Yong is poor. His father dies. He had taken care of his father uh, when his father was old. He hears Dong Yong plowing the fields, and his father is seated in a wheelbarrow. Such an earliest depiction in the world of a wheelbarrow proves that the Chinese invented the wheelbarrow. Um, so the dad is sitting in the wheelbarrow. He's got this special cane here. Only people over 70 years of age are given these canes by the state. It's a free gift when you pass 70. Um, it's like a little bird on top. When you pass 80, they give you gifts of meat and silk and wine, too. And when you pass 90, you get even more. Uh, but 70 is the big landmark, so you get this little cane. So this is how we know he's old. And it says Yong Fu, Yong's father. And here he is plowing. So his father dies. He can't afford a funeral. Well, filial son always puts on a big funeral for his father and mother. So he sells himself into slavery to get the money for a funeral. Sells himself to a creditor. And in response to this, heaven sends down this god here, this weaver maiden. She's actually a constellation who's a, a goddess. Comes down. And says, I want to become your wife. And he doesn't know she's a goddess at this time. He thinks she's a, a crazy person. Why do you want to become a wife of a slave? You'll be a slave too. And she says, I can help you. So they go to the creditor, and he says, well, I didn't get asked for two people. I asked for one. Well, why wouldn't you want two? And she says, well, I have skill. Well, what can you do? I can weave silk. He says, well, if you weave me a thousand bolts of silk, I'll set you both free. 
So, of course, she's a weaving goddess. She can weave this silk in like a day. And so the creditor frees both of them. And they both free people again. So here we see a mono scene. Um, actually, it's not a mono scene. It's a simultaneous here. The father of the wheelbarrow, Dong Yong plowing, and the weaver maiden already coming down from heaven. Here, you've got to adjust your eyes. I flipped the black and white so you can see the carving a little bit better. Here, you always see the dad in the wheelbarrow. That becomes the mono scene. Always have the dad in the wheelbarrow. And here's Dong Yong here. And here he's plowing. But that's the only scene we get. We don't get the weaver maiden here. This is a mono scene. This is from the 6th century AD. <coughs> now this one um, is a simultaneous, I mean, excuse me, a continuous. This is more than one scene depicted in a beautiful landscape. Now by the 6th century AD, this, the sarcophagus in the Nelson Museum in Kansas City is amazing. It's one of the most amazing pieces of Chinese art in this time period. Um, they actually give you clues on how to read the story, what direction. It's the wind. You read it left to right because that's the way the wind is blowing. On the other side of the sarcophagus, the wind blows the other way. So you know which way to read it. So you start by reading here. Here's the old guy. He's sitting in his wheelbarrow now, beautifully three-dimensionally shown. And here's Dong Yong plowing. He's got his hoe here. Now we have a break here. The trees kind of at least stop you from seeing uh, him twice. Now here he is meeting the weaver maiden from heaven. So here we have uh, another place in time. We read to the right. The other thing that they do on this sarcophagus is they give you resonances from nature. Uh, in Chinese poetry and Chinese art, animals often imitate the actions of humans. These two deer here represent the married couple. Sometimes you'll get uh, lovebirds in a tree. So these two deer frolicking here represent that these two will be married. And sometimes there's other clues you'll see in the trees. You'll see monkeys or cranes or other things which symbolize the human actors in the story. So here we have a continuous depiction of the story from the 6th century. Okay, next story. I gave you the translation of the story of Yuan Gu. Yuan Gu is a very wily 15-year-old. His father and mother are terrible. But it doesn't matter if your father and mother are terrible. You're still supposed to serve them loyally. Even if they try to kill you, you're supposed to serve them loyally. And we'll see that in a story coming up. So Yuan Gu here, this little boy, his father thinks that grandpa is too troublesome. He thinks that grandpa is too hard to take care of. They're going to go throw grandpa away in the wilderness. <laughs> so they take a stretcher, and here's a stretcher. And they put grandpa on the stretcher. And they walk him off into the wilderness, and they leave him there to die. And the son, he couldn't talk his dad out of this before, but they're out in the wilderness, and here's Grandpa. He's sitting here begging and pleading not to be abandoned. And the son then picks up the stretcher and starts taking it home. And his dad, who's over here, says, uh, why are you bringing that thing back? That's very unlucky. He says, well, <laughs> one day I might need this to bring you out. <laughs> so you bring it out. I may not be able to make another one of these, so I'm going to bring this one to use it on you. And the dad says, okay, all right. Too fast. Like, let's go home, get Grandpa, and bring him home. So they go get Grandpa, and they bring him back home, and get happy ever after. Okay, so here we have another version. This is the mono scene, the great scene, where here's the, the Grandpa. Notice, once again, the bird came, indicating his age. He's over 70. And here's Yangu picking up the stretcher and leaning over to his dad, saying, i got to bring this home to use it on you. And so this is the, the mono scene that you pick from that. And once again, the captions indicate each character. Okay, now we'll go back to that sarcophagus in the Nelson Museum. Once again, very lavishly carved. And this is multiple scenes. And so we have to follow the continuous narration. And we have a reverse, a sort of a reversal here. So we start here on the right. And here is the dad and the son, and the boy is indicated by the little uh, top knots on two sides, showing that he's a young boy on the head. And here's Grandpa. He's got a nice beard here. And they're marching Grandpa off into the wilderness. And then they leave Grandpa here. And so here's Grandpa sitting in the wilderness. And here's 
uh, Yangu picking up the stretcher and talking to his father here. And the symbol of Grandpa is the crane. There's the crane sitting up here in the tree, symbolizing the old man here. And so here we have the scene here. It goes this way, comes around this way, wraps back, and goes that way in the landscape. Okay, this is one of my favorite. This is also in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. This is from a funerary couch. A funerary couch is a platform that you put a coffin on top of, and it's shaped like a screen, a three-sided screen. And so people would also see this at a funeral as well. And these have filial piety scenes all over them. So here we have the scene. You probably recognize the elements by now. Here's the dad. Here's the grandpa. And here's the little boy. See the little cop knots here. And they're carrying you on the stretcher off into the wilderness. And then here is the next scene where the grandpa, looking you know, suitably pained and distressed, is pleading here. But there's a little bit of a trick here, a visual trick. The artist was playing with space and time. The father is making eye contact with the future. He's actually looking into the next scene and seeing what he's about to do to this guy here. This is the same character. And he's seeing what's going to happen to him one day, too, if he does this. So he's actually making visual contact with another scene in the depiction. And that's something that I haven't seen in any other example of this. They break that rule when they, they communicate across time. Okay. So a more entertaining, a more lighthearted story now. <laughs> Lao Lidza. Lao Lidza is really old himself. He's the son here. He's already himself 50 or 60 years old. But you're not supposed to show your age because it makes your parents feel old. And so he dresses as a little boy into his 50s and 60s. He wears the top knots, he plays with toys, he cries like a baby. And he's serving his parents here. This is the mono scene that usually the parents are seated up here on the dais, and he's bringing them food. But when he's bringing them food, he trips, and he falls, and he hurts his arthritic knee, and he starts crying, but he cries like a little baby, so that they don't think that he's old and stumbled because of his arthritis. So he stumbles like a little baby, like over a toy. And so this is supposed to make them feel young. And here we have another depiction of it. This one's from a little bit later. This is the 6th century. Here's Lao Lidzen, looking like a little boy. He's got a little, like a yo-yo in his hand. He's got a little top knot. And this scene, you always see this too. This is a bird toy. It's like a little, a little duck full toys that kids have. This is a little bird on wheels. And he's pulling the wheels and he's hopping and skipping and playing for his parents, even though he's got arthritis and he's 50 or 60 years old. <laughs> and his mother is here clapping to the music right here. So that's the scene we get from the Mount Liza story. <laughs> now, here we have uh, from the Another, that funerary couch from the Nelson. Here it's a little hard to see, but we've got the mother here clapping. Here's the father. And here's La Liza. Here they've depicted him old. You see he has whiskers. He's just stumbled because his legs aren't working properly. But there's the little duck. So really carefully, there's a duck on wheels right down there. So that's the clue to his, his voice, his young uh, nature. He's supposed to be uh, feigning for his parents. Now, from a lighthearted story to a really heavy story that turns out good. The story of Guo Zhu is depicted uh, multiple times in many different uh, media. I'm going to show you a lacquer coffin, a stone carving, and a brick. So Guo Zhu um, is taking care of his widowed mother. They're living in a poor part of town. They can barely afford to make ends meet. Guo Zhu's wife gets pregnant. And her pregnancy is indicated by two things. One, she's got a pregnant belly here, which is really the earliest depiction of a pregnant female uh, in Chinese art. And she's holding a lotus blossom, which is about to open. So this is signifying that she's about to give birth. So 
Gorchu's wife gets pregnant, and he realizes that he cannot support a child and his mother at the same time. So he is going to kill the baby. He is going to go off in the wilderness and bury the baby alive in a pit. And so the next scene shows him digging a hole in the wilderness because he's going to commit infanticide so that he can support his parents, which are more important in the hierarchy than your own children. You're supposed to feed the parents first before you feed your own self or your own children. So he's digging a hole, and what does he find at the bottom of that hole but a pot of gold? And this is his recompense from heaven for supporting his parents. So he finds a big old pot of gold here. So this is a segmented narrative. You see, scene one, break, scene two. This is lost right here. Okay, so we see, uh, once again, that funerary couch from the Nelson Atkins Museum. Here is uh, Guoju. Here's the baby. We actually will get a little depiction of the baby. I think, excuse me, this is Guoju's wife holding the baby. This is Guoju. He's digging the hole. And here's the pot of gold. But here we also have the mother. Now the mother was obviously not present at the barrack. She would probably not condone this. But this is basically the next scene. This is part of the continuous narration. They, she brings the baby, they dig the hole, they find the gold, and then they talk to mother. Uh, this is the mono scene version of it. This is from a painted clay brick. <laughs> and here we have a caption, very literal caption, gold, one pot. <laughs> As if you don't know, I mean, that looks like a mound of potatoes, if you don't know what that is. And Guoju and his wife. And so here she's uh, holding the baby, and here he's digging a hole, and there's a pot of gold. Notice these 6th century and 5th century ones have beautiful plants that are always populating these. Uh, here we have from the Nelson sarcophagus, unfortunately I don't have the very rightmost portion. This is a continuous, <clears throat> we start here, here's a beautiful depiction of her kneeling down saying goodbye to the baby as the husband is about to bury it in the pit. He's digging the pit, there's the pot of gold. Then we move up in this direction and we see them, here's the husband, the wife, now they're carrying the pot of gold on a big pole. Um, she must have the baby on a papoose here. I don't see the baby at present. Uh, maybe the baby's riding in the pot of gold. I don't know. Um, they're carrying the baby back. And in the next scene, which I've cut off here, unfortunately, because I couldn't find this right portion this morning, is them presenting the gold to the mother, saying, finally, we're rich, and they're a big, happy family, once again, off to this side here. Okay. So now, one more story. But before we get to the the long cycle I want to talk about, too. This is the story of Tsai Shun. Tsai Shun is the ultimate mama's boy. <laughs> Tsai Shun has a psychological connection with his mother. Uh, it's said that when his mother needed to call him, when she thought she was in danger, she would bite her fingers and he would feel pain. It was a really close connection. And then his mother dies. She was quite elderly, but she died. And so he has the coffin here lying in state. And this is the exact shape of those coffins I was showing you. They have these sort of trapezoidal side panels. And a fire breaks out in the town. Here's the fire. Fire breaks out. Everyone's wailing. Here's the water brigade uh, bringing the water to try to put out the fire. The fire is about to consume the funerary parlor where the body is laying in state. It's actually just a side building of his house. So he will not evacuate. He lays on top of the coffin to try to protect the coffin, and the flames pass over just their house. So that's the, the reward from heaven. And the loyal dog is his symbol right here, showing the loyalty of the sun. And so the flames pass over because of the loyalty to his mother. And it often says in the story that uh, I gave you that whenever there was thunder, he would go to his mother's graveside and comfort her because his mother never liked thunder. And here we have a, a mono scene of that from another a funerary couch. Here are the, the men bringing in the coffin. Here uh, you see the flames up here on the roof. And here he's uh, praying that the flames will pass over their house. Okay. 
Now I want to get to a slightly more involved story. This is the longest translation I gave you. This is the story of Shun. Shun is one of the mythical rulers of ancient China. Shun was one of the early um, semi-divine kings before the known historical kings. But there's also a sort of Cain and Abel story that goes along with Shun. And I gave you a translation of the different fragments of that story. So I'm going to show you that cycle of that story depicted as a segmented narrative from a lacquered coffin that's dated between 467 and 470. Originally, probably 10 scenes of the cycle were depicted. Only eight survived. And it's a segmented, perfect example of a segmented narrative illustration. Okay. So in the story, um, Shun's father, Gu so, marries another wife. His wife dies. He marries another woman. They have another child. The father becomes deluded and favors the new son over Shun to the extent that he and his stepmother try to kill Shun repeatedly. But every time, Shun escapes. And so in one of the killing scenes, this is, and the caption literally says, this is the time when Shun's stepmother is setting fire to the building for she wants to immolate him. And the caption actually says, this is the time, meaning referring to a specific time in the story. And so here's the mother, and here's the granary. She says, you know, go up and repair the roof of the granary. He goes, okay, he goes up there, and she lights it on fire. And then he somehow forms almost wings and flaps his way down and flies off the top. He's buck naked here. Um, this is a very odd to depict the god of the Chinese pantheon as, as naked. People always clothes, but this shows that I guess his clothes burned off or he had to take them off, but he's depicted naked here, jumping off the roof. But regardless if they tried to kill him, he still served them loyally. Now, another incident in this cycle is he's sent to go down a well to maybe clear it out or something by his father and his stepbrother. So he's sent down the well. This is the wellhead here. And it says, Shun is made to go down the well to retrieve one coin in this story. Then they fill the well with stones. So they throw a bunch of, here's the stones that they've thrown uh, in the well. And, but he secretly escapes out the eastern neighbor's well. So he goes underground, swims underwater, and then comes out the neighbor's well next door. But he still serves them loyal, even though they're trying to kill him. Okay, so the story goes on and on. All these different methods, they're trying to kill him. They try to poison him with alcohol, uh, all these different methods. And eventually, he gets married and leaves home. He's given two wives by the ruler of North China, and becomes a very rich man in his own right. And his father becomes blind. He becomes blind spiritually, blind physically. And so this is Shun's father going about blindly. And so his father and mother, stepmother, become homeless. They live in the marketplace. And Shun and his wives are very prosperous. The next scene shows Shun's stepmother carrying... Um, a bunch of sticks to sell in the market. She's gathering firewood. They're on hard times. So this is his stepmother, uh, not depicted quite glamorously here, um, <laughs> collecting sticks to sell in the marketplace. And this is Shun and his two wives. And it says they get a bargain in the marketplace. They make double profit in the marketplace. So he's really successful. They're in the market. But while they're in the market, they spot stepmother, and his father. And so this is a scene where his parents see him and his father's eyes are open spiritually and physically. He can see again, and he suddenly realizes that he's been a very bad father trying to murder his son for years. And so the father then reconciles with the son. The son had always been loyal to the father, and the son eventually becomes the ruler of all China. So this is the cycle in segmented narrative divided by these little flame triangles here of the Shun cycle. And here's the climax when the father can see and hear again and everyone has a happy reunion.
Okay, that same scene is depicted on that painted panel I showed at the very beginning. Uh, here is the ruler Yao giving his two daughters in marriage. Here's a nice, more three-dimensional scene of his father and stepbrother throwing the rocks down the well. And this scene, which is broken by damage, shows the mother setting fire to the granary, is what the caption says. Okay. <clears throat> so those are the different stories I wanted to go through. And now I want to deal with some of those problems that we mentioned at the beginning. Remember when we went through the Greek and Roman and Indian examples? Um, in the Greek or Roman examples, um, the continuous follows after the simultaneous, the monocene, the segmented. But in China, there's a big delay. There's no continuous narration in China, it seems, and we'll look at some counterexamples, until after AD 500. Now, it's possible then that Buddhism is the impetus. Buddhism is the trigger. Now, why do you even need a continuous narration? A mono scene does just fine. If everyone knows the story, you only need one scene to remind everyone of the story. But when Buddhism comes in, nobody knows the stories. These are not long, treasured Chinese stories. There are hundreds and hundreds of tales that no one's ever heard before. So it's possible that these Buddhist tales were so unfamiliar that they needed stronger storytelling devices for all the stages in the story. And they're already depicted in this way in cave temples in India and in Central Asia, right on the doorstep of China. So I'm going to show you some examples of these uh, fifth century examples uh, in Central Asia. And then we'll see, is there really any evidence that the Chinese didn't invent continuous narration on their own before Buddhism, or was it the influence of Buddhism that brings it in? Okay. So let's go to a cave temple, Buddhist cave temple, at the site of Dunhuang. This is 5th century AD. So this is before we see any continuous narration on the Chinese main territory. This story should be familiar to you by now. This is the deer Jataka that we saw in that medallion before. But this one is depicted as a continuous narration in a landscape. So here is the deer rescuing the man from the river. So here's the river. It goes kind of in bands like this. Here's the deer rescuing the man from the river. Here is the man promising the deer not to tell his secret. Right here. Here is the king coming in, sending his men to go capture the deer. And then here is the deer bowing before the king. And here is the deer once again um, talking to the king, and the king and his men are worshipping the deer. So this is all within the same landscape, with these hills dividing it. And this is a very Indian style of painting. This is not the contemporary Chinese style of painting. This, these early caves are very much similar to Central Asian and Indian painting styles. This site is in the far northwest of China. Uh, it was outside of bounds at that time of of imperial control. There's an even more elaborate one. This cave is precisely dated. This is cave number 285 at the same site, uh, dated exactly AD 538. This is the conversion of the 500 robbers, another Buddhist tale. So here we have a bunch of bandits and thieves, cutthroats. Here's the king's men. They're all going in to capture these bandits. So that's scene one. Now they're all rounded up. They're all rounded up. They're being put on trial by the king. And the king then punishes them by ripping out their eyes. So here they're having their eyes ripped out down here. They're being punished for being murderers and criminals. Now we move to the right in the same mural. Here are the robbers running around in the wilderness, starving, naked, and blind. Not knowing where to go, who they are, what to do. This is in the same scene. It's right behind that building that they got put on trial. Now we go to the scene to the right. They hear the words of the Buddha. They hear the words in the wilderness. And here is the Buddha preaching. And immediately, they are all converted. They all become pure. They can see again, at least spiritually. And they all become disciples of the Buddha. All 500 of them. 
of course, you can't depict 500, so how about 5? <laughs> you know, multiply by 100. So this is a beautiful, continuous narrative in a gorgeous landscape from Buddhist painting that's very non-Chinese in its style, right on the doorstep of China, about the same time those depictions I showed you from the 6th century show up. So is it really brought in by Buddhism? Does Buddhism really bring in the continuous narration style to tell these stories, the Jataka stories? Or did China already know how to do this from earlier? So that's why I want to take a look at some examples. <clears throat> this is the earliest representational art of any kind in the Bronze Age in China of human beings. And there are these uh, wine containers, and we see scenes on them. This is playing bell music and chime music. Well, women gathering mulberries from trees up here. <clears throat> and some people have argued that this depicts a story. This depicts the gathering of certain things and then the ceremonies, that this is a, a progressive narrative, a continuous narrative. But it turns out that no specific ritual is depicted, no specific battle is depicted here. These are genre scenes. <coughs> And with the definition of narrative that we gave at the beginning, this does not fit. This is not a narrative. It's a depiction of a genre, of an, a kind of activity, generic. There's no transformation of the protagonist. There's movement in space and time, but there's no alteration of the physical or emotional state of a protagonist. So this is not a narrative. What about this? This is a lacquer box where the decoration's been wrapped out so you can see it all, from 316 BC. And we see characters in a landscape. There's a bunch of people here in a carriage, and there's a person greeting them here, then a bunch of people talking, and then we see people in a carriage here again, and then people talking, people in a carriage, people running in front of the carriage, so some people have argued that this is a narrative. This is describing a guest arriving, being met by the host, uh, then having this conversation, and then the guest leaving the character. Now, this might be convincing, except for the fact that you can't identify the protagonist in each scene. He changes clothes. Uh, his, his robes change color. And so you can't say for certain that it's the same person and that it's not just a genre, again, a genre of reading and leaving. So this is a very advanced painting for 316 BC, the most advanced we've ever seen of a landscape. This is really the best landscape you can do in 316 BC. You don't have any mountains, but you certainly have trees. And now we go to what's upstairs. What about Lady Di's Banner? Lady Di's Banner, the reproduction that's upstairs, might depict a continuous narration of sorts. Could this be a pre-Buddhist continuous narrative? So here's the, the tea banner that was laid on top of the coffin that was face down so she could read it. It's for her. And it shows the progression from her corpse in the tomb to the heavens. It shows her ascent to heaven. So it's narrating a spiritual journey from the earth up to heaven. So if we look at the bottom scene here, we see this Atlas-like figure holding up the physical world at the bottom, standing on top of two big fish. And in the physical world, we see a funerary banquet taking place. This is a coffin. This is her coffin. This is a picture of Lady Di in her coffin. And these are the mourners, probably her descendants. These are the, the vessels that would be buried in the tomb later on. Now we go up to the scene in the middle. This is Lady Di herself. We know that because this is the cane that was found in her tomb. These are the kind of robes she was wearing. And this is her stooped back from the tuberculosis and the arthritis and all the illnesses that she had. And these are her uh, attendants, three on the right, two on the left. And here she's passing up this sort of conveyor belt, this elevator to heaven, this causeway, passing through the circular disc, which is the symbol of heaven, up to this gate right here, where there are two gatekeepers, which block the entrance to heaven. 
Now, at the very top, many people would argue this is also Lady Di. This is Lady Di transformed into an immortal spirit. She's no longer human, which is indicated by the snake coil of her lower body. But they argue that this is her, and I would say I agree because three attendants on the right, two on the left, you go up three attending birds on the right, two attending birds on the left, that this is her transformed. So why can't this be a continuous narrative? This is a narration of the protagonist being transformed in the most uh, dramatic way from a corpse to an immortal spirit going through these stages through a landscape which involves the earth all the way up to heaven. So perhaps this kind of narration was practiced by Chinese artists. They knew how to do it. But maybe it just wasn't until Buddhism came with its need, its need to tell all these stories, that it was deployed.